I just wanted to start um, maybe just with a couple of provocations and to ask for some feedback from you. Um, you've all given us some incredibly cogent, uh, I guess, kind of analyses of, of, of why, you know, kind of obfuscation um, of our infrastructures is, is so dangerous. Um, I think James Bridle wrote about this quite cogently in his recent essay for Matter, where he said that the intangibility of contemporary networks conceals their operation, um, which seems to me like a, a bit of a, a pithy summary of some of the kind of the, the, the problems that we're analysing here. And I just wonder if I could just ask um, each of you to just say, you know, kind of very briefly, what you consider to be one of the, the primary problems of invisibility. Maybe starting with you, Timo. Hi. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I think the, the, there's a very troubling development in technology, which is the movement towards seamlessness, uh, the movement towards uh, the, you know, making, a very, making it very desirable for actually hiding technological infrastructures, hiding it below uh, very slick and uh, supposedly seamless uh, interfaces. I think that's, it's very desirable, you know, the idea that we wouldn't have to deal with technology. Technology will know everything that we need to do and it'll, it'll serve our needs. Um, that's quite, kind of a desirable vision, but it's also really problematic in that it, it hides a lot of the ways that these things work. And, it, and it's, uh, there's a brilliant researcher called Matt Ratto who says that, you know, it, it hides all of the things that, that, that make the way, uh, that reveal how that technology has agency over us. And... Mm. Uh, and it's, it's really, really problematic. So I think, of course, we, we, we can't all be dealing with the, you know, the, the raw mass of technological infrastructure all the time, but I, there must be ways of, of um, sensibly revealing it and allowing us to, to have some understanding of it so that it's not, it's not just about experiencing designed seamless experiences. Um, like I think about two different things. One, one about a, tr a truly invisible um, uh, infrastructure. You know, thinking about something like uh, Kenya, where you know there the, all those you know billions or millions of handsets have started to make um, new concentrations of power that are really dangerous and uh, um, like. Yushahidi, which was a really interesting platform crowdsourcing program. Now, just with a few changes of lines of code, there's a there's a platform called Jana, which is uh, masquerading almost as something which is going to help everybody and actually compensate everyone for the kinds of information that they provide in crowd in crowdsourcing. Um, uh, but actually, you don't know, first of all, they have you know, 3.8 billion consumers on their, uh, on their website feeding information back to them. Uh, and they're researching sometimes for the UN, but sometimes for Unilever. You know, so, it's, so there are things like that that I think about that are in my field. But the other thing that I would say is that sometimes, I mean, I guess what, often what I'm working on is, is an infrastructure that really isn't invisible. It's all, it's all around us. It's only invisible because it's all around us. Um, uh, and what's invisible are the kind of undisclosed or, or undeclared activities. There are many things that are uh, uh, kind of distracting us as content. Um, but a lot of the logics and the you know sort of invisible softwares are what I'm trying to uh, increase our awareness of as architects. Uh, I would say um, that we should all be aware. It's it's easy to approach a city and say that oh it's it's equal for everyone. But if you take a you know look at a tube map of um, how it looks if you're in a wheelchair, it is a vastly different tube map. Uh, it's, it's not equal. It's not an equal city for everyone. And uh, people like Robert Moses, who, who intentionally build in infrastructures that would favor one group of people over another, you have to be aware that even though it's digital architecture and we're moving into, into that, you know, I don't want to say a higher plane, but a different space, um, the people who build those infrastructures do not build them equally 
either. And they have, certain, as you say, secret ways to change the flow of information, the flow of data, and that will benefit some people over others. And I think PRISM uh, and this revelation about how everyone's being monitored and, and, and their information is being stored and calculated somewhere is a big change in the way that people approach their online profile in the sense that we used to worry about people hacking your computer and you had to, you know, there's programs on TV where they, they pull the modem cable out the back of the computer because you can't let the bad guy into the physical computer itself. Um, and that, that, that's changed now and realize that all of the, that information resides outside of that physical box in front of you and, and you need to know, you need to know where to pull the cable out, as it were, somewhere much further down the line. Great, thank you. I'm sure that we're going to have questions. Um, okay, we've got one here. I might take I might take a couple at once. So, did I have, see any more hands up? So, we'll take one there and one at the back, and then we'll answer both of them at the same time. And try and make them short. And can you tell us who you are? Uh, hi, Aral Balkan. Uh, Timo, uh, I, I loved your talk. I loved the exhibition. Um, but uh, I have a question about what you said here about seamlessness being a problem. Um, do you think it's possible once people have experienced seamlessness to then give them solutions where the seams are very apparent and, and, and expect them to accept those? And also, do you think that seamlessness and open are mutually exclusive, or can we layer the seams? Second question. Do you want, do you want oh, me to yeah, answer actually, that Actually, that one feels quite big, so let's, yeah, okay. let's have a, mm -hmm. a response to that first. Yeah, um, I think the, the, the difficulty is that seamlessness is, is a very desirable thing, and that being forced to, to then deal with something underneath it uh, is, is then really tricky. Um, and I think it sets into place a whole set of expectations about what technology is and all of the metaphors and the ways in which technologies are, are imagined and the meanings around them are, you know, are being developed in, in these highly sort of totalizing seamless ways. Um, and it's very difficult to work against that. Um, <laughs> I don't, th I don't actually know about the question about open versus seamlessness. I, 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 am very, I don't have, a, have an opinion about the term open, so I can't really answer that, I think. We'll take the second question back. Um, Sophie Mayer. Um, I'm very uh, glad to hear in, in all of your presentations references to previous forms of network and technological change, because I think one of the... Um, strands uh, of what Anna said, obfuscation, is an amnesia about the fact that we've gone through multiple generations since consciousness emerged of technological change. And it was interesting to hear you touch on paper mapping and forms of cartography uh, on the emergence of the railroad, electricity. Um, and for Timo, I, this question is for everyone, but in Timo's paper, I kept waiting to hear something about cinema and the way that cinema has been thought about as a technology that is both material and immaterial that has so many metaphors and myths that have sprung up around it, in particular the myth of seamlessness, which is a term that's used to describe the way that Hollywood tells stories, so that the, the mechanics of cinema and indeed the mechanics of culture and political thought are invisible in how it tells stories. So I just wanted to hear a, maybe a bit from each of you about working against that amnesia and what we can learn from the way in which past technologies have shaped our reality. So, Keller, amnesia. Um, <laughs> um, uh, well, a lot, lot, a lot of the um, American infrastructures that I've looked at are based on based on a sort of ecstatic amnesia, um, um, uh, replacing uh, cycles of obsolescence and, and replacement. Um, uh, I mean, and this is actually, in some ways, a, a response to that your question and a response to the previous one. But it's, um, I, I've been wanting to do a little bit, maybe what Alan Sakula inspired us to think about, you know, um, that, you know, in, especially in the 90s when he was kind of like the first one to go out and fish story, you know, and look at, at uh, what was going on in a kind of containerized world. Um, but 
what I found inspiring was that rather than just kind of dealing with all of the seamless virtual packets of things, he went to look at the heavy, slow stuff, the acres and thousands of acres that were being changed as a result of a few faders and dials, uh, were to, and were to look at you know, the, what's behind the computer in gigantic you know, container transshipment landschafts and so on. So there's, um, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> <laughs> Frank and Nisha. Ah, uh, well, um, I like, no, I, I, I like this, I, this, this, this idea of seamlessness and the, the need of having seams to pick apart how something works because as a, a science writer, uh, often my job is to present a, an idea as somehow cohesive and convincing. It has to be convincing at the end of the day. And I've often compared that in my mind in, in constructing a, a narrative to dressmaking in the sense that you have to, your argument is the, is, is the sort of the lady inside the dress and then you, you build something that pinches in the right places and uh, emphasizes the right points. But most importantly, you have to hide all of the seams because if anyone can get their finger into one of those seams, they will tear it apart and then your argument is exposed for all of you know, the, 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 what it is. Um, and, and maps and, and all other infrastructures are the same in the sense that you, it, they have to be convincing. They have to be a convincing narrative. And if the government says that you know, unemployment goes, has gone down, they've seen unemployment go down, uh, that sounds like a really convincing narrative because we, it doesn't get into the nitty gritty of what that figure actually means. And that might mean that loads and loads of people are now working part-time jobs and so they've not only lost their benefits, but they're working something like a zero hours contract and they're actually in a worse position than they were before, but the government claims that it's a success. Uh, so yeah, that's my contribution. <laughs> so I wonder if you can pick up specifically on the comment about cinema. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Just, think, just thinking about that. Yeah. I thought your, your comment about seamless editing is really good. Just seamless editing is the idea that was developed by Hollywood that you would watch a film and never have noticed an edit. So there's an enormous amount of effort going into the editing process in order to make sure that you didn't notice any of those. All of those edits felt completely natural. And that's really weird that you're watching one shot and it's completely different in, in one frame to the other, uh, and yet you didn't notice it. And, you know, an incredible amount of effort and theory went into working out why that, why that was. Um, but now in cinema, of course, you don't have to have seamless editing anymore. Seamless editing is, is part of storytelling through film, but it's also, it also can be completely broken down. And a lot of contemporary film is is not seamless in many ways. It uses editing as a way of, of telling a story. So I think uh, you could possibly say that um, we're in the early stages of the development of highly ubiquitous technological infrastructures that are being sort of, well, all of the emphasis is on seamlessness and making sure everything works together. Um, but as we all get more used to these things and get quite curious about them and they become part of our culture, we can start to then break them apart and we then start to value the seams and the breakages and start to use them as part of our work. So the sort of experimental film stage sure. of seamlessness. That almost kind of directly leads us to this question of aesthetics because one thing that um, really occurred to me when I was hearing all three of you speak actually, um, but particularly in your two talks, was the fact that we're, you know, kind of adopting a very critical position about, you know, kind of these infrastructures, these technological systems which are reaching into our lives. And yet we're articulating our critique in a highly aestheticised fashion. Um, and, you know, certainly one of the, the, the big pieces of um, feedback that we got from the Immaterials exhibition, which opened yesterday, was that people find the films beautiful because they are, you know, they're aesthetically gorgeous. Some of the maps that you showed us, despite their frightening kind of political content, are beautiful. These images of these sort of free, you know, the free zones that you were showing us, desperately frightening, but yet beautiful. Um, so I wonder if we can just pick up on this question of, of aesthetics and does this, does this get in the way of the critique? Is it actually contributing to the obfuscation in a sense? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite a deliberate choice on our part. Yep. I mean, in order, in order to um, to affect change or to to participate in the discussion that is is dominated by Apple, Microsoft, mm -hmm. producing highly persuasive and very uh, very uh, high production value in a way uh, uh, visions of what 
contemporary technology is and, and should be, um, we feel like one of the ways of addressing that is to is to sort of um, produce images that are, are are intriguing, are spectacular, mm -hmm. are, have a, have a you know, very high attention to detail in terms of their visual and their narrative qualities. And I think it's actually central to our approach that that to sort of engage in in that discussion and to provide sort of points around which people can can. Uh, uh, situate themselves. I think that's it's really important to be able to do that. Otherwise, the popular public uh, technocultural imagination is dominated by people other than us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to come up on aesthetics? I would say that no one likes, an, from a from a science writer perspective or just a writerly perspective, nobody likes an, an ugly truth. Um, and trying to change someone's mind simply by presenting the facts to them uh, is rarely ever works, sadly. Um, you, people would much rather that their prejudices be flattered than their, their views be challenged, uh, which you know, obviously it makes it difficult for me, it puts me in a hard spot. And trying to tread that line to change someone's view about something, but at the same time not make them feel like they're under attack or that they're, they've been diminished in some way because they were so foolish to believe you know, X is Y, uh, the day before or the, the, the moment before they read what I had to write. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a tricky part of mm -hmm. writing. Yeah, I heard Bruce Sterling say something at, at well, I don't know, some conference. It was about design fiction. And he kept, and he kept saying, you know, why does design fiction have to have this, um, I don't know, ama amazingness or fantastic amazingness? Um, but, I, but I suspect it probably does. I mean, just for all the reasons that you mm -hmm. mentioned, it really does have to be mediagenic to kind of break the beam and mm -hmm. change the conversation. For my stuff, I think that, the, you know, that one would look at that and see it as attractive is more problematic um, uh, because I'm, I'm, and I haven't figured out um, maybe how to demonstrate that the aesthetic regimes I'm talking about are not depicting but enacting. Um, so how, I'm not exactly sure how I, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, We've probably got time for maybe one, possibly two questions. Uh, well, there was one over here, and then, I can't see at the back, has anyone got their hand up at the back? No, okay, so one at the front. <clears throat> um, Taylor, I just wanted to ask about the, um, the free zones, the economic free zones. And <coughs> I was interested in your kind of mixing of um, computing metaphors with economic reality. And what, I, <coughs> what I'm curious about is what you think your perspective and the kinds of metaphors you'll be using adds to a simple discussion about the political economy of those um, zones because you describe them as lawless, and yet they're full of the police. Mm. They're police regimes. And so, do you mean lawlessness in the sense of a, of a stateless regime without the rule of any kind of law? Can you just develop your notion of lawlessness and also address the question of the relationship between computing metaphors and political problems? Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe, the law, maybe to say lawless, you know, is a bit... Bit melodramatic, um, but 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 it but they are authorities independent from um, the the laws of the whatever their host state. So they they can create. They are they are. It's an independent authority. So say this host state um, has signed a global compact about labor. Um, that's off in the zone. Um, so, and it's selective for different zones. Um, uh, you know, in some zones, like in, in Dubai, uh, there's some zone, there's some zone, the Dubai media city, there's free speech in that zone, <laughs> but not really anywhere else, technically. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of um, a raft of laws that are, that are uh, so selectively on or off in, in these, um, in these zones, um, but it's not, and you know, maybe you, you could say it's, it's not exactly lawless like Giorgio Agamben's lawless, it's sneakier than that. There's a, there's a, a, a way of trade, it's not just a single emergency of state or something like that. There's, there's trading uh, exemptions between countries in a very messy soup of 
make, making one sneaker is involved with, you know, trading all kinds of uh, exemptions from regulation or something like that. Um, so it, you know, it's a, it's a stable form of exemption, uh, a soup of exemptions. That would be a more accurate way to say it. And you're absolutely right to, that it's, it's over, you know, it's too much to say lawless. Um, um, and the other thing, um, why I bring up the software metaphor, um, it's, the, it's the best way that I, it's the quickest way that I can get to um, uh, the idea that there might be protocols that are not part of, a, of, of the prevailing technical languages that run development now. As I said, coming from like McKinsey or, or uh, econometrics or informatics, um, where space is a kind of byproduct. Um, so what I'm wanting to say is that there are spatial variables that one leads with, um, and that there are little spatial machines, little spatial software is just the easiest way to say it, that there, I could say interdependencies, um, but it's somehow a little bit more vivid if I say softwares, and it's metaphoric. Um, but uh, that there are little, I could say diagram, you know, I could use Deleuze and Guattari's notion of diagram or, uh, or dispositif, um, little machines of interdependency that one can put in place that are not a master plan, but that are a way of kind of ratcheting changes uh, over time. I don't know if that's any there. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, well, that's the end of our first session, Revealing Reality. And I just want to, uh, you know, kind of help, you know, help me, if you can, thank our three fantastic speakers, Kayla Easterling, Simone. <laughs>